Hey everybody, this is uh, Pastor Jim here, and I'm excited today to uh, do another interview in our series entitled Humanizing uh, Race. And uh, today I have a friend of mine named uh, Mike Wolmer, and uh, Mike and I have known each other for what, probably seven, eight years, I'm gonna guess, whenever you moved yeah. to Victoria. Um, and so Mike, as you can see, is Caucasian and white. But I've asked him to be part of our discussion because uh, when Mike moved to Peoria, Illinois, uh, the Lord laid a specific vision on his heart. And his vision was to plant a uh, multi-ethnic church. And he's been intentional about that from the beginning. And so uh, long before what's happened the last couple of years, Mike has been leaning into this idea of as a Christian, how do we cross the, the racial divide? How do we communicate uh, across traditions and histories and preferences? and uh, these things that tend to divide us. And because of that, he's had some unique, unique experiences of trying to blend a church. How do we worship when we have Hispanics and African-Americans and Caucasians? How much is too much? How does everybody give and take? So that's why we have Mike today, and I think he's gonna have some great insight for us. Mike uh, also uh, was uh, Trevor's baseball coach there in Illinois, and so uh, he played minor league baseball for the Yankees and uh, was in the military and now is a full-time pastor, also works uh, on the side as well, but a, a great guy that I've known for a while. And so, Mike, welcome. It's great to have you. So thanks for joining me on this uh, interview. Oh, wow. It's, um, it's a pleasure to be here, Jim. And, uh, and I'm just thankful that to have had the opportunity and to offer whatever insight I can, especially into this topic, which is a uh, very near and dear to my heart topic. So, Well, first of all, Mike, what are you, uh, when you see what's happening right now, you know, it's been a chaotic, chaotic time between COVID and uh, everything that's happened since George Floyd. I think things have been building before that. But where are you? Where are you encouraged right now? Where do you see optimism and hope inside of you? Um, actually, believe it or not, I find myself extremely encouraged right now, probably more than than other times, simply because I think the one thing that is happening more and more and more is that the conversation has continued. You know, it's been historically in the past where these types of events and these types of things come up that generate these emotions and these feelings and, and, and generate these truths about um, systemic racism and, and police brutality and other racist pieces. And then the conversation seems to end. It seems to dissipate after a few months, um, a couple of months. And, and this one in particular has not. This conversation has continued, and I believe actually it's gotten stronger. So that actually encourages me because um, it's it's a topic that has to be ha have conversation. It, it there ha it has to be talked through, walked through, and experienced by everyone involved. And the only way that happens is if it has some long term um, long term power and, and has staying power. And I believe this particular conversation right now does. I think a big part of that is because you've got everyone on this conversation and it's not just um, black and it's not just the black community that is in this conversation, but it's even the white community, which is what has encouraged me um, here in Peoria. They had um, um, protests like they did in many cities across the country. And when I went, when I looked upon what I saw, I literally saw black, white, Hispanic standing together over this issue and I was I was deeply encouraged by that and I'm continued to be encouraged one of the things that that I do think a lot of hopefully as you talk about the conversation a lot of white people are still hesitant to have the conversation because mm -hmm we're afraid. And I've even felt myself this way the last five months, you know, I mean, I've very, uh, very open, inclusive. I've had a very good working relationship, especially back in Illinois with the African American community. Um, but the cur current climate, there's a lot of fear that, that we're going to say something wrong, or we're going to say yeah. something different, and then we're going to be labeled a racist. So a lot of white folks are afraid of the conversation, because they're afraid if they say something foolish, they're going to be labeled, and then sort of, you know, cast out. Um, but I think we just have to have it. And and if you have safe voices, I find that someone that you know you can talk to that's a minority, you know, that provides the opportunity to talk through those things and to, and to process them. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. I think that is actually the key, um, especially as a, as a white man. Um, one of the things I've acknowledged, um, and, and the acknowledgement and, and having voices are, I think, both the keys. The, the voices, meaning I have people in my life um, in the black community that I, that I talk to that I ask questions of when I don't understand. And we have that because we built relationships. You know, by building that relationship, 
let them genuinely see my heart and genuinely see the person that I actually am. And so then I actually have conversations. You know, when um, I actually formulated a, I, I don't do a whole lot of handwritten type statements. I speak a lot from my heart. Um, sometimes it gets me in trouble. Sometimes it comes out wonderfully. But um, in this particular case, I, I actually wrote down how I felt um, when all this took place. And we came and reconvened in church in June 7th after, the, after our, when our, we felt like the Lord led us back to meeting pers- um, together after, through the pandemic. And I wrote down how I felt about the George Floyd and about racial divide and about police brutality and all these things. I, I wrote it down and I actually literally ran them by a couple of uh, people that I'm in relationship with in the black community. And I said, this is what I want to say. Am I coming off genuine? Is this, is this, does this seem like it's very real? Because it is real to me, but does it come off that way? I don't want to say anything that'll be offensive. So being willing to be critiqued is, is I think, very important. And that was a big part of it. And then the other piece of that is acknowledging. I realized that as a white man, um, there are things that I've never had to experience. Um, the analogy I use, and it's not necessarily understand that at any point in time, I can be pulled over by a police officer speeding. And I can actually incessantly question that, that being pulled over. I can, I can ask to see evidence, I can in question, I can be, I don't want to say belligerent because I wouldn't actually be that way, but I could be fairly aggressive in my questioning with zero fear. And I don't think that exists in most communities among the black community. And so I acknowledge that certain things like privileges that I've had because I, I am white and things that, and when I say privilege, I don't necessarily mean I was granted things because of my skin color, but I didn't have to work as hard for some things because of my skin color. And I think between acknowledging those things in different communities, every community is different, but I think acknowledging those things and then having relationship with people where I can actually speak and ask questions for understanding has really what's um, encouraged me and emboldened me really to, to speak out. And now, I, now it's continuous. Now it's something I do on a regular basis. It's something that I speak about um, in our church on a regular basis. It's something that I speak about in my conversations um, and the, but the key starts with actually being intentional about building those relationships because they don't happen naturally because nature, what gravitates towards one another. So Mike, as you, as you talk about that, about being pulled over, one of the things about having relationships with minorities and part of the reason I'm doing this is because when I see things on television, um, in the back of my mind, I often have questions like, I'm like, well, what about this? And what about that? And you know, how did this actually go down? because I know a lot of police officers in my church. I had in Illinois, I had a lot of police officers, um, black and white police officers, by the way, and I'd be interviewing an African-American police officer in one of these interviews. So I hear their side of the story and sometimes they see things. But when I have people that I know, people that are friends of mine and they share their personal stories where they feel that they were profiled, they feel like they were not treated fairly. And when you start to stack those stories, you start to realize maybe there's something there, but I'm not going to get that by watching the nightly news. I'm not gonna get that by seeing internet headlines. And I'm not gonna, because someone forwards something on Facebook, I'm just not gonna necessarily always take it at face value. And that's why relationships are so very, very important to be able to hear people's stories. And that's part of the reason I'm doing this interview is to allow people to hear the stories of of people. With all that being said about where you're encouraged, what are you concerned about? Um, I'm actually concerned that, because here's what I believe, I, and this is challenging. I believe that it's going to take that relationship between white and black to really make a big difference. I think it's going to it's going to take the, the the white pastor, the white leader, to 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 find their voice in this, and their voice of support, their voice of lament um, over history of what this has looked like in our nation. I think that's a big piece of that, and um, I think the unity that's going to be necessary for this 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 movement to really progress is going to be. Um, critical, and that's the concern I have. That there are, and that's why I love this. That, that see you're doing this um, is that's the concern I have. That people will actually engage relationally with one another. I um, mean, that's really. I mean, it's great that you're using this story of the Jesus meeting this woman at the well because he crossed the divide and saw a person, and that's what it's going to take for all of us to cross the divide and see a person and connect with them, partner with them, engage with them, listen to their stories, advocate for them and with them. And my concern would be that 
the, the, the white pastor would, or the, and the white leader, not just in the pastor community, but the white leader would be afraid to use their voice, afraid to maybe rock the boat a little bit from maybe some of their, the, the longtime friends that may not feel the same way. Um, I know that's been um, a challenge that we've actually faced in our church. Um, one of the things that has happened over the last, let's say two months, two plus months, is that we've had a family leave our church because I made the statement that black lives mattered and um, they could not wrap their mind around a white pastor saying black lives matter and not falling into, well, all lives matter. And so while I agree, of course, all lives matter right now, black lives are the ones that are challenged ones that are facing a huge, a strong uphill battle. And so if that white voice being, being um, scared to speak up because of situations like that one, someone might, unfriend them or walk out of their church or whatever the case may be. Yeah, I wish people, yeah. And this was, this is a thing that we have to try to communicate to people. It's like, you know, when they had the Boston bombing at the Boston marathon, you know, there was a lot of things, Boston strong, Boston strong. Well, well, what about Phoenix strong? What about LA strong? Well, something happened there that allowed the entire country allowed to say, Hey, we're, we're focused on Boston for this thing, because it's not that other cities in America don't matter, but that matters. The same thing happens when you have, you know, breast cancer awareness, you know, yes. and baseball players are wearing pink bats. It doesn't mean that prostate cancer doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that brain cancer doesn't matter, but it's like you focus. So when, when we do say, when people say black lives matter, that that's really what it's saying is you're not saying all lives don't matter. Uh, but it is amazing that um, it's it's hard for us to you know to hear that and people become very defensive because even your church to, to, to hear you say that Mike someone walked out left your church you're intentionally built a church on diversity principle diversity trying to be a multi ethnic church and I think that that story you just shared where my mind goes is I think it exposes the idealism we all have this idea that we're just going to live together and it's going to be you know great and we're just I love everybody and I don't have a racist bone in my body and all these things we say. And yet there's certain trigger words and things that just reveal to us there's still so much. The idealism of living together in harmony sounds good to all of us, but it is very complex. When you get down to it, it's very, very difficult to do. It is very difficult to do. Matter of fact, um, I was, I mean, you remember when I came to the city of Peoria, I mean, one of the first things I did was sit down with you. Um, and I, one of the things I loved about you the most was your candidness, your honesty, your upfront. Like, I mean, you encouraged me, but at the same time were, were, were very straight with me. And I loved that about you. And one of the things that I didn't, I came in here bright eyed, bushy tailed, like, oh my gosh, we're going to build a multi-ethnic church. It's going to be fantastic. And, and God's going to bless this thing. It's going to explode. It's going to be amazing. And it has been the hardest seven years. I'm coming up on seven years in September. It's been the hardest seven year journey of my life in ministry. Because it is hard. It is very hard because every four, five, six steps we take forward, right? It's like, wow, this is going well. We're seeing the, uh, what I see as a picture of heaven on earth. And one thing takes place. And it's almost like all four or five steps that we went forward cease. And then we went seven steps back. And so now we have to recover those two, two, three steps and then take those steps again. Um, one of the biggest challenges that I saw as a church was when Donald Trump was elected. And we don't get political and that's not the point of this at all, but that represented such a challenge for several of the black people in my church that there was a lot of conversation and counseling that took place in the, in the, in, after that happened that it was just so much fear that was gripped. And that was one of those moments we took a few steps back to then come back. And we've had several of those things, cultural challenges, um, especially in the church. The church is one of the challenges when it comes to race because there's a lot of culture within the black church. And when it's missing, say in a multi-ethnic church, it becomes a little bit more challenging to engage. So as you say that, that's I, I think one of the challenges that I see is that, that in all these conversations, I think that in that we tend to project, we, it's, it's the guilt by association, it's sort of these assumptions. So there's certain words and phrases and we just assume, so, so um, when, like when you say Black Lives Matter, like I said, people say, oh, Mike, I didn't know you're, you're, a, you're a liberal and you're a socialist and you, know, you support AFNI, you know, you know, all these different assumptions that are tied to that. And as you know, the organization Black Lives Matter does stand for principles that you and I would not stand for. I mean, you know, we, we, we support the nuclear family. We support, you know, all those kind of things. But, but you, people tend to make all those assumptions when you say that word. It's a trigger for some people. And they say, oh, Mike's one of those people, right? 
the African-American community, I think, has somewhat done that with Trump, where there are certain things where anyone who supports Trump, well, that means you're a racist and you support things. And so we, we tend to, I think that's part of the thing that as Christians, we have to be able to be aware of our heart and we have to try to resist those triggers that causes me to judge, to judge a person based upon the worst extremes. Um, when we did the No Joke Project, which the when you know which you're familiar with, and we had you know, my my rabbi friend and my imam friend, and we were doing some different conversations. One of the principles that we talked about was, I I should not compare my best with your worst. And that's one of the things we do sometimes when we have these kind of conversations about religion or race. We tend to sort of we we assume our best as a group, and we're like, well, yeah, I know that's, but that's an extreme, you know that that. So when someone that represents my tribe does something foolish or says something, we sort of brush it off. But then we're always highlighting the extreme negative of the other, the other group, yeah. or, or, and that is a flesh issue. That's a maturity issue that we have to go through spiritually. I agree one hundred percent. And you and you face something similar to the lashback uh, in, in those relationships that you built. Um, and, but that's one of the things that you were amazing at is you actually pushed forward through those relationships, and it was fantastic to see that because a beautiful thing came from that. But that's the same thing it's going to take in this in this in this situation, in this context is we're going to have to push through some things um, to really see this happen. I mean, we're not like we were in the 1950s and 60s by any means, but the the white people that came along side of Martin Luther King in those moments and pushed with him experienced a lot of problems. And we necessarily won't experience the same problems, but there'll still be some that we'll experience. And, and my hope is that we'll push through them and continue that journey and continue walking because it's, it's an important one because, um, because it's just, it, there has to be on all levels from laws to government to success rate to family lives to communities, there has to be a, there has to be a level playing field. So, Mike, where do you see in all of this? Where do you see God at work in all this? Where, for you personally, where do you see? Where do you think? Where do you see God at work in all this? And are there any scriptures that are really alive in you right now that you just keep thinking about that you're locked in on or biblical principles? Yeah, one of the amazing things that I've experienced in this, um, and it's exciting that you're using this passage because when we came back as a church, it was literally right around the whole George Floyd thing taking place, and we came back. I preached two weeks. Um, a, series, a short little message series called Walk Across the Street. And the whole point of it was intentionally engaging those that aren't like you, that don't look like you, don't think like you, don't act like you. Um, and so if I'm thinking about two specific stories, I'll be very brief. I'm a preacher, but I'll be brief, I promise. But um, the two specific stories I'm thinking about is the one you're talking about in John 4, Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well, but also then the story that, it, that is told in Luke 10 about the Good Samaritan. Both of those situations include um, Jesus not only himself crossing racial divides, um, and actually gender divides in that day and age, racial and gender divides with the woman at the well, but also encourage others to walk similarly with the whole story of the Good Samaritan, to, to, to see them as people, to see everyone as a person and meet their need. I mean, the woman at the well had a need, Jesus met it. The Samaritan, uh, the, 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 the one who was robbed had a need that was met, that needed to be met and the Samaritan met it. So they were walking across the street. And so that's kind of like the, 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 the mantra, so to speak, of the last several months for our church, especially. We have highlighted a lot of that walking across the street. And I actually laid down a, uh, um, I laid down a, a bold challenge to the people, in the, to, the, to the white families in my church, is to what does that look like for you relationally? What are your, what is your relationships with other ethnicities, ethnicities look like? And I even said, I said, you know what? If you're questioning whether or not you, what that looks like, oh, I don't have a racial bone in my body and those types of statements, then here's what I need you to do. I want you to open up your phone. I want you to go to your last 25 text message conversations, your last 25 phone call conversations. How many of them were with somebody of a different ethnicity? Mm. How many of them were someone who didn't look like you, think like you, or act like you? Because nature is we congregate together over likes and similarities, right? It's hard sometimes to see similarities in people who don't look like you or who have different culture or don't think like you. So it's actually going to be intentional. The same way I had to intentionally build a multi-ethnic church, we have to intentionally build multi-ethnic relationships. And it goes by saying, I'm going to 
uh, put away all of my personal will, desire, emotions, and everything. I'm going to push that away so that I can engage with someone else and hear their story. And a lot of it is, is listening to stories. And I do this all because, you know, when I read the book of Revelation chapter seven, and I see John's revelation, when he says, he says, I see a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, every tribe, every people, every language standing before the throne of God and were in worshiping. And so that to me is like this beautiful image of what heaven's going to look like. And I'm thinking if that's what heaven looks like, we should get a, a head start here on earth and have a picture like that here on earth in our personal lives, in our churches, whatever context it works and how it fits for each person. But I think that's important. So that's like the two stories and the, and the passage of scripture that has really shaped my entire theology on multi-ethnicity, but also um, even in this season, it's just reinforced things that I have felt and thought and believed all, uh, all these years. So. Yeah. And one of the things you said there, when you talked about engaging people and, and I love the story about the phone, the 25 who your last 25 text messages um, is that as we engage in those relationships, it's very important that we also we approach them with questions and listening, not just with statements, because I think, I think that's, that's where we, we, we hear. And if we hear, we don't have to agree with everything, you right. know, I mean, I, I just had conversations with an African-American pastor uh, recently, and he had asked me to read a book that, I, that I'm reading. And quite frankly, I'm having a hard time with some of it. There's some good stuff in there, but some of it I'm having a hard time with, and it's making me feel a little uncomfortable in places, and some of it I don't fully agree with. But in that conversation, I told him that, you know, and we're talking through this thing. And so, like I said, you don't have to agree with everything, but in the conversation, in the wrestling, in the listening that's where there's often growth. That's where God can open our eyes and we can see things that maybe we were blind to. Because one of the things that I say, you know, all the time to our people is that we have to be careful that because all of us are prone to being blind, but more importantly, we're blind to our blindness. Mm. You know, we're, we're blind and we don't even realize we're blind. It's like yeah. in the days of Jeremiah, I'm doing a sermon series and Jeremiah you know, Jeremiah is trying to exhort the people to repent of their sin, and they don't think they have any sin. They can't see that there's anything wrong. When Jesus confronts the Pharisees, the Pharisees have no idea. They think they're living righteous, holy lives. They have nothing to repent of, and Jesus is trying to open their eyes and see that, you know, you guys are far from God. You think you're okay, but you're not. And, and yeah. that's where I think listening, trying to listen to God and listen to people, because all of us have these blind spots. And, and, and we have to be able to acknowledge that I am blind to certain things in my life, and I have to be willing to try to listen to them. Yeah. Oh, that's, uh, that's so good. Uh, blind to our blind spots. That is, that, that's, that's fantastic. That's exactly how it describes the process of listening. Um, I, I, I had to, I, I'm still on that journey, but I had to go to a, through a similar journey just as a leader and as a man to, to be more intentful about my listening and less, less, less forceful with my statements. Because I'm a very statement guy, as you, you have no doubt learned and known. But I've gone on that journey as well where I need to listen a lot more. And I, it's interesting because I'm a whole lot more likely to listen in that context in my relationships with, with um, in the black community and my friends than in, in a lot of other places. I, I probably because I, like, I, I feel like, if I'm being honest, I feel like in that context, I need more information. I don't have the answers and where I tend to think I have all the answers in other contexts. Which, right. I don't, but, um, but that's the one of the things that I've realized is that questioning and listening has changed. That has changed my life. I actually grew up multi-ethnic in all my, in all my lives in New York and military and everything. So I'm not even familiar with some of the things that other people, especially in the Midwest are familiar with. So questions and answering is so critically important. Mike, knowing you, when you said, you just said a moment ago, this is an area of my life where I realize I don't have all the answers. My, my mind immediately went to the fact, because you've been living this for 30, 40 years. You were raised multi-ethnic. Your, your father was in the military. You've been exposed to a lot of minority relationships in various parts of the country, in New York and Baltimore and the Midwest, you know, playing minor league baseball in the military. So, so this is an area where you've been exposed to it for so long, and you've had these conversations for decades yeah, that, that you realize I don't have the answers. And, and once again, that's because you've been listening for a long time. You've had these conversations. And but the people that haven't had as many conversations who maybe work with two minorities, you know, 20 years ago, or I've had one neighbor that, that we have to work a little bit harder in those situations to be able to try to listen. Um, Absolutely. So one thing, what, if there's one thing that you wish that Christians, uh, Bible believing Christians 
would would understand or do about what's taking place in our country, what would it be? Um, number one, that it's that it's very real. This is a very real issue, a very real problem. A lot of people like want like just as quickly as they jump on the all lives matter idea, they want to jump on the well, it's not as bad as it was in the fifties and sixties. And and they're absolutely right, but that's where we our bend is to lean towards well, it's not as bad as it was. So it's is it really as bad as I see now? Well, media obviously. And so uh, blowing things way out of proportion sometimes we're challenged. But then on top of that, um, just knowing that it's real. And then the other thing, and this is one, one of the things that more recently is by my suggesting that Black Lives Matter doesn't mean that I don't believe that other lives matter. We had that conversation, right? So that we can actually, and you've said it and I said it, and it's already, I think, been a little bit of a theme here. You don't have to agree with everything to actually walk with one another and love one another and care for one another. You know, I can say things like Black Lives Matter, but I don't have to agree with the organization itself because I don't. I, I don't a agree with most of what they stand for. So I think um, for Christians in America, especially about race and, and white, is that it is very real. The, and, and minorities, Hispanic and black folks need and, and honestly, from, my, from what I've gathered, more often than not want the help of their white brothers and sisters, especially in the church, to stand with them and walk with them and care with them. And so I think if we can do that, even if, like, like you said, for me, it's been a little bit easier because I've lived this life for so long. There's still a bunch I don't know, but I've lived this life for so long. For the one that hasn't, who, like you said, I've had two friends that I've worked with or I led one neighbor one time, that's more like – be intentional about meeting someone, connecting in relationship, and be honest with them and just say, a part of why I connect, why I desire to connect with you is I want to understand. Yeah. Help me to understand. And if we can do that, I think that will be going to change the story. Many, I think you have the same experience. Many of my uh, black friends that work in secular jobs, they'll talk about how many, quote, friends that they have, white friends, but they never want to talk about this. It's like, it's almost like taboo. you like, you know, like we'll talk about everything, but anytime it gets a the subject, there's like, you can see people tense up. And, and so, but most of them, I think they relish the conversation. They're not nearly as uncomfortable with it as, as a lot of times we, we can be. Um, so one final thing, um, yeah. what is, what is one suggestion that you would have um, that you feel like you're, you're moving towards, or you feel like other people, what's one suggestion you have for people to, uh, to really glorify God in all this and to help be a bridge to everything taking place in our country. Is there an action step? You said, you know, to understand it's real, but is there an action step that you would encourage people if there's just one thing to do to say that's really gonna honor and glorify God um, and, and help sort of be part of the solution, what would that might be or what might it be? Oh, an action step. So I think, um, I think one, I think an important thing, is the, the main important thing, and it's been like the theme of, of a lot of things, several things I've said and even my life is, is, is live, live intentionally, intentionally seek out relationships, intentionally seek out understanding, intentionally do those things. And then with what, you, what you're learning and what you're growing in is then like nothing showed more support, especially here in Peoria. And, and I've had conversations. I have, I've had, I've pretty much spoken to, sat down and had a cup of coffee and spoken to virtually every black friend I have in this city since the first week of June. And one of the things that is a, a resounding theme in all of that is the, the, the active partnership with white people has been a huge blessing. So like even in the marches, like standing with somebody, right? Just standing with someone and loving them. And, and like and here in Peoria, I went downtown and, and, and spent a few, a little bit of time just in the, in the peaceful protest. You know, and, and it was, it was peaceful. I know we see some stuff on the news that is not peaceful and it's, un, it's a very unfortunate and that's not, again, not any, nobody I talk to wants to see that happening. They condemn them themselves, but things like that, where you're standing with them in, in just outside where they're gathering to, for something that's important to them, just gather with them, stand with them. Um, I know, and that's a challenge. That's, that's, that's going to be a difficult thing for a lot of people to do. Um, but at the very least, um, we can we can be intentional about our relationships and intentional about our learning and just and just engage people and that's a that's a big action step and that's probably where it would start for a lot of people especially without a lot of um, experience.
it would start there. Um, I don't know that somebody with no experience is ready to jump out into a street and start protesting and holding a sign with people that and, and, and I think that's and that's understandable and that's and that's fair and it makes sense. But at least from a relational standpoint, be willing to step outside of our comfort zone, meet people and introduce ourselves to people. I, I am certain even the one who is the, the one white person who doesn't know a lot of people does at least know one or two black people that they've worked with or they do work with or maybe a family that comes to their church or whatever that they can engage with even just in a conversation to start understanding yes that's excellent well good work mike and like you said no matter how how young or old we are no matter where we are it's just and i think so much of it another verse that's been going through my mind is let, let everyone be you know quick to hear slow to speak and slow to get angry and uh, and then we have to be willing to listen and and uh, and and like I said, be intentional about engaging. So, Mike, you've been great. I appreciate everything. Is there anything else you want to say before we wrap up here? Oh uh, no, just thank you for having me. I'm excited to even be a part of this conversation. Um, I have relished those conversations. Like I said, I've had many, and I'm working on some things here in Peoria to be a part of the conversation from a a bigger perspective. Um, and so I'm just I'm excited to be able to talk about this any given time, and to do it with someone like you who I value as a leader, but also as a friend has been a, bl a blessing. So I appreciate that. Thanks for the opportunity. All right. Thanks, Mike. Love you, man. Take care. And uh, hopefully we'll uh, see you sometime. Yes. Hopefully see you soon. All right. See you. Thanks. All right. Bye.